<coughs> so as the title of my talk implies, my research is on cryptocurrencies, and unless you've been living under a rock, I assume that you have a general understanding that cryptocurrencies are seemingly at least a tiny bit important to the modern digital economy, right? This is exemplified by this plot, which depicts some stats for Ethereum, the second most popular cryptocurrency. And judging by the volume of transactions processed by Ethereum on a daily basis, when I took this picture, it seems that, well, at least Ethereum is relatively important. It processed about uh, one and a half billion uh, USD worth of transactions each day. So, given that cryptocurrencies are important, obviously they should be secure. And to help cryptocurrencies reach their full potential, they should also be efficient in the sense that users shouldn't wait too long or spend too much money in order to have their transactions processed. But unfortunately, we see that cryptocurrencies tend to get attacked on maybe a daily basis, or maybe I'm just pessimistic. And furthermore, we see that popular cryptocurrencies tend to get congested. And in times of congestion, fees can be very high. Okay. So luckily for us, uh, a whole science has emerged trying to tackle these two issues, trying to ensure that cryptocurrencies are secure and efficient. Okay, the science of blockchains. Unfortunately, previous works for example, on security issues and blockchains, didn't always consider the most realistic and practical settings. Okay, for example, some famous attacks, such as selfish mining, were never observed in the wild, and as far as we know today, don't have any real implementation that can be actually executed on the real cryptocurrency. Not in simulations, but on the real cryptocurrency. Okay, this doesn't diminish from uh, the importance and influence of these studies. For example, the selfish man mining paper is extremely elegant and beautiful, in my opinion. Furthermore, previous works also sometimes tend to consider very specific subcases, which are not entirely general and do not necessarily apply to all cryptocurrencies at all times. Okay? As before, this is again reasonable. I mean, science has to. Uh, progress step by step. In my work, I try to tackle these issues. I try to conduct research that is highly practical and highly relevant to real world settings. Okay, so for example, with respect to security, I try to consider threats, security threats which are very practical, which can be executed by, well, maybe not anyone, but which can be executed. Uh, in the wild. And to demonstrate the practicality of my approach, I implement attacks on real <coughs> cryptocurrency clients, and I also in uncovered the first evidence of a major attack, of, of an, an attack on the consensus mechanism of a major cryptocurrency. The first such evidence uncovered uh, by the literature. And furthermore, I try to generalize some of the analysis uh, performed by previous works from specific subcases to more general settings. So, in this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on the security side of things. Um, and specifically, I'm going to focus on this work here. Okay, just this one work. But I thought that this is like a nice thing to show because by presenting the domains of my papers, you can kindly, you can kind of see that cryptocurrency research is highly varied. It involves a lot of different uh, methods borrowed from different fields. Okay. But in the talk, <laughs> in the paper I'm going to present now, uh, nothing is really borrowed. It's like highly super duper concentrated on the security side of things. Cool. So before I proceed with technical details, let me give you like a super high level explanation of what cryptocurrencies are, because so far, even in the previous talks, no one really said what cryptocurrencies are. Cryptocurrencies are payment systems. They allow people to 
exchange funds, okay? So if users wants, want to transfer funds between them, they create transactions that do so, okay? A transaction. In order for user payments, user transactions to be processed by our payment system, they have to be broadcast to the distributed network of nodes that operate the cryptocurrency. These are called miners, okay? Miners process transactions in batches called blocks. They collect a lot of transactions and put them in a block. Miners that create blocks can collect fees from the transactions that they put in their blocks, okay? So they receive some form of compensation for their work. So this is a high-level description. I'm using the terminology miners to refer to these nodes, but in other cryptocurrencies, in specific cryptocurrencies such as Ethereum, sometimes uh, different terminology is used. And specifically in Ethereum, instead of having one type of node, we have multiple types of nodes, okay? The specific technicalities are not relevant for this talk. So I'm just going to call all the nodes miners or actors or whatever, okay? So in the paper uh, that I want to focus on, which is called Speculative Denial of Service Attacks in Ethereum, which is also joint work with Kai Wachin, Li Zhu, Aviv Zar, and Arthur Gervais, uh, we focus on Ethereum's transaction fee mechanism. Okay? And in Ethereum, transactions can not only transfer funds, but can also execute arbitrary pieces of code. Okay? And <coughs> because arbitrary pieces of codes can vary in their complexity, and thus in the amount of computational resources that are required to execute them, it makes sense that more complex transactions would pay higher fees, and vice versa. Okay? The computational complexity of transactions is measured in a unit called gas. So, if a transaction <coughs> uses more gas, okay, spends more gas, it pays more fees, okay? Very reasonable, not too complex. In this work, we show that Ethereum's transaction fee mechanism is actually susceptible to different kinds of attacks that arise from one observation. That only transactions that enter a block can pay fees, okay? Transactions that do not enter blocks do not pay fees, meaning that if transactions are processed, people spend effort and computation on processing transactions that never enter blocks, then essentially we impose a lot of work on our blockchain, but do not offer compensation in return. We call <coughs> this general phenomena as speculative investment of resources, okay? So let's take as an example some miner that is currently building a block and its block is filled to its maximal capacity, okay? Suddenly the miner hears of a new transaction that seems to pay higher fees than any of the existing transactions in its block. It makes sense for the miner to kick one transaction out and put the new transaction instead, right? Because it pays more. So by doing so, the miner <coughs> essentially wasted all of its compute, all the computation efforts that it put into this transaction are essentially wasted because the miner would not be compensated for them because this transaction is not included in the block. Only transactions included in blocks can pay fees, okay? So this is one example of a speculative <coughs> investment of resources. Another example is demonstrated by a work led by uh, Tony Wallstatter and other co-authors, which is also accepted to www. In that work, we examine the practice of censorship in Ethereum. So way back in August of uh, 2022, the US government decided to sanction an Ethereum application okay, called Tornado Cash. These sanctions imply that Ethereum actors that wish to abide by the regulation and rules of the US government should never process transactions that interact with the sanctioned entity, with Tornado Cash. Okay. 
In Ethereum, as I said, transactions can execute arbitrary pieces of code. And given an arbitrary piece of, piece of code, it's impossible to foresee in advance its, <coughs> its execution, right? So in order to, to verify that a transaction does not interact with our sanctioned entity, we have to execute it in its entirety, right? In the worst case, at least. So another type of speculative investment of resources is, for example, if I am a compliant miner, if I live in the US and I'm a miner, then if I see a transaction and it doesn't seem, at least immediately, that it's not compliant, then I execute it. And upon finding out that it's compliant, then I cannot include it in a block, meaning that all the resources I invested in executing it were <coughs> thrown to the trash, essentially, right? So given this observation, this general Given this general observation, we present various attacks that allow us to, uh, <coughs> to waste the computational resources of other competing actors, for example, other miners. And I don't have enough time to discuss any of the attacks, but um, the, <coughs> the impact of our attacks mean that adversarial actors can spend a low amount of money to waste a lot of resources by other blockchain actors. And this allows adversaries to prevent other actors from essentially processing any transaction, okay? Transactions generally. This makes sense for adversaries because if the adversary is a miner itself, then by preventing other miners from processing transactions, then our adversarial miner now has all of these transactions to itself, right? We harm our competition, we help ourselves. And yeah, I don't have much time, so let's conclude. <laughs>